Okay. All right. Let's let's uh, let's get started this evening. So, welcome to Lunar and Planetary Institute. Um, glad to see it's a full house tonight. This is great. There's even some folks in the overflow, so it's even better. Uh, this is our final presentation in our 2018, no, 17, 2017, 2018 series, diving into ocean worlds. We've been hearing about planets in our own solar system, or sorry, not planets, but moons in our own solar system of, of the outer planets. But we're going to leave our solar system tonight uh, and, hear, and hear some more about uh, extrasolar planets. Uh, if you're viewing online with us tonight, thank you for joining us. I uh, hope you come back. Um, so tonight's the last one for this series, and we'll take a break for the, for the summer. And then starting up in September, maybe October of next year, uh, we'll, we'll have a new series. I don't have a catchy title yet. I'm still working on that. But the topic is, um, a few years ago, you may remember, we had a series of presentations where our speakers were talking about missions. So current planetary missions, or missions about to launch, uh, or missions that were wrapping up, or we had an update on Curiosity. We're going to revisit that uh, and look at some of those missions where they are now, kind of. Well, that's, that might work as a title. Um, <laughs> uh, we're gonna, so we're going to visit some of those missions like Juno, New Horizons, uh, some really cool stuff coming out of uh, these missions. So keep watching our website or uh, look for um, emails from me as we get more information on that. If you don't get emails currently and would like to, you can sign up at the table uh, by the front door um, and you'll, you can start getting them. All right, so don't forget this, after, or this evening afterwards to join us for reception in the lobby. If teachers are here with us, we've got certificates for you at the receptionist desk, uh, as always. Um, and if you could fill out a short survey on the other table by the front door, uh, that would be much appreciated as well. All right, so tonight uh, I bring up Dr. Alan Treeman, who's the Associate Director for Science, or is that, is that right? Or Okay, <laughs> here, here at LPI. You'll probably recognize him. He's, he's spoken here before, and he's usually here at these presentations. And he's going to tell us more about tonight's speaker. Okay. Thank you much. It is finally my time to get up here briefly. <laughs> um, yeah, we're very, very pleased to, uh, to have Dr. Susan Letterer come speak with us uh, this evening. She's at Johnson Space Center and was for a very brief time a visiting scientist with us here, moved over to Johnson and has had quite a fantastic career over there. Most of her work, as I understand it, has to do with orbital debris, space junk, that our satellites run into and other satellites create out there. And she's worked uh, on, on locating it, uh, understanding how, how, it, how it moves around. She's the PI of the telescope, which is now um, Ascension Island, right? Which is now primarily used for orbital debris tracking. And there are how many pieces out there that you track? Ton tens of thousands? So there are definitely millions if you look at things that are at really, really small sizes. But we, yeah, oh, I'm, you're so I, yeah, I okay. am like, um, so yeah, the U.S. Air Force is tracking 23,000 pieces. We're just sort of surveying it and understanding okay. the, the characteristics. But yeah, there's, there's millions of pieces out there. So you know, it, it, it's a potential big problem for our uh, for all nations spacecraft, and Sue's deeply involved in that. At the other end, she works in the, in the gun laboratory over there where they test how space debris hits objects like a spacecraft out there, fires little particles at multiple kilometers a second, and sees what happens, and mostly it's small booms. But, but that's, 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 a good, that's a part of her work. Um, she has been... Um, Involved, I guess, I guess through the telescope work, involved in the discovery of the Trappist uh, One planetary system, and she says she's very humbled to have been involved in this work, and so that's what she's going to talk about is this fantastic Trappist One planetary system. So I give you Sue Letterer. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And first, I want to say hello to all of you. Um, is everybody having a good night so far? Yes. Very good. I hear that some of you came from Rice University and from Clear Lake also listening to other lectures tonight. So now you can sort of sit back, relax, and hopefully not fall asleep. <laughs> Should be good. And, um, and also, hello to all of you that are out there in the podcast world. I know that my brother and my dad and family back in Wisconsin, sister-in-law and, and Godlin are all watching. So hello to all of you and uh, the rest of the world out that, that's watching as well. So today, we are first going to have Alan 
shut the lights off. We were trying to figure out how many PhDs it took to turn off a light earlier. <laughs> Turns out it's just one. So, <laughs> so now you know. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the ultra-cool TRAPPIST-1 system. So this is actually a system around an ultra-cool dwarf star, which is very exciting to us as scientists because then we can write formal papers with the word ultra-cool in the title. <laughs> It is a system where we have now discovered seven terrestrial planets, which is a huge number. At the time, it was the most terrestrial planets that had ever been discovered around any other star anywhere. So as you all know, we have four terrestrial planets, terrestrial meaning the ones that you can walk on. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all gas giants, so they don't count for what we're talking about tonight. I'm sure they count in other ways, but not for our talk tonight. So TRAPPIST itself is in the constellation of Aquarius. Some people are curious about where it's located, so I just thought I'd show that quick slide. And then mention that this is truly a team effort. And you'll see a lot of names that definitely have um, an international sort of a flair to it. There are, last I counted on, on the most, one of the most recent uh, nature papers, I think about a half a dozen that were from the US, and the other of the 30 were all uh, international. So it's a very, very international group of people and an amazing group of people that work really well together. So I have a lot of respect for everybody on the team. Uh, Michael Guillon is the PI. And if that sounds very French to you, he is actually Belgian, French-speaking Belgian. So the whole thing was led by a group of Belgian astronomers. This is how it all began. A very small 0.6 meter telescope called TRAPPIST South. At the time, it was just called TRAPPIST because TRAPPIST North hadn't yet been built, but it is now. And TRAPPIST itself has sort of a ring to it, TRAPPIST. Some, may, some of you may have heard the word TRAPPIST before when you went out for a drink, <laughs> probably. Might have been one of those. TRAPPIST, it turns out, is a Belgian beer. So mentioned just briefly ago that the PI happens to be a Belgian astronomer. Do you think that it's just wholly ironic? that they have a, yeah, a telescope called TRAPPIST. No, no, no. TRAPPIST stands for, they were sitting around around beers, no kidding. How can we make TRAPPIST be the name of our telescope? <laughs> it is the Transiting Planet and Planetesimal Small Telescope. <laughs> yes, they worked really hard, but now they have a whole entire system, and they're all very smug about the fact <coughs> that it's named after a beer. So this very small telescope is designed to look for transits, as I mentioned earlier. So we're going to talk about what is a transit first. And you can see here, imagine along with me that you have a tiny little firefly. So this firefly, I think, has uh, maybe drank a little bit too much Red Bull. It's really super bright for what a, a um, probably most of you have seen fireflies before. They're very, very faint. But imagine it's on a million candle watt, sort of a spotlight. Now, that's basically what it's like trying to look for planets going around other stars. It is very, very difficult. So instead of directly imaging them, what we do instead is we look for that planet to block out a tiny little bit of starlight as it goes in front. So if you have a star that's like the sun, and you have something that's about the size of Jupiter, when Jupiter passes over the top, what you'll see is you'll find that a dip, maybe 1% in depth, will block out light from the star, and you see a transit. Now, imagine that if you have an Earth-sized planet and it goes around the sun, what it blocks out is something more like 0.01%. So trying to find planets that are Earth-sized around stars like the sun is really difficult. So that's the equivalent of this little red line in the bottom left corner compared to looking at big Jovian-sized planets. And by Jovian, I mean things that are the size of Jupiter or larger on that class, Saturn, big planets. So not surprisingly, we have preferentially found a lot of big planets around other stars. Also, everybody wants to know, does life exist someplace else? And if we are going to understand whether life exists someplace else, we want to start off with, well, we know that life can exist around a sun-like star, so let's start looking at sun-like stars. So we started with that as well. But not the TRAPPIST system. The TRAPPIST telescope itself decided, we're going to try something a little bit different. And instead 
of looking at sun-like stars, they decided to look at something more like red dwarfs. Red dwarfs, and very, very small, at the smallest end of the scale that you can possibly have hydrogen fusing into helium. That's what defines a star. It's only 80% greater than, than the mass of Jupiter and only 20% larger in radius. But because it's so much smaller, it fuses its hydrogen a lot slower, so it's a lot cooler. Cooler and smaller means that when you have something that's the size of the Earth, the size of the Earth relative to this guy is a lot bigger. Great. So that would be a great target to look at because if you're looking for Earth-sized planets, the depth of the transit is going to be much greater. Kind of like Jovian planets going around Earth-like stars. Good idea, right? Yeah, that's what they thought. And you know what everybody said? <laughs> you're not going to, it's never going to work because really Earth-sized planets, there's not going to be enough material that collects to form planets around stars that are that size. So the beautiful thing about the universe is it doesn't buy <laughs> arguments <laughs> necessarily that people come up with. So if we can have seven existing around here, you can imagine it actually can happen. But when you're looking at a little bit of starlight that's blocked out, it turns out that sometimes you also have spots on the surface of your star. So if you have a star spot, like our little sunspot, and the star itself is twisting around, it might mimic a planetary transit, right? So you've got to be a little bit careful because when you first see that light blocked out, they were looking in visible light in the red, but they were looking in the visible. Like, well, so it, we think maybe it's a transit. We're really excited. They've been looking for five years. <coughs> five years. Every night that it's clear, they're looking for transits. Occasionally comets and asteroids, but mostly transits. And they found nothing, 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 nothing. Coolest exoplanet system ever. <laughs> So sometimes you just got to wait, and uh, you might get lucky. But <laughs> you got to make sure it's not a star spot, right? So I love this. In fact, uh, I think he's in the audience here tonight. Somebody just sent this to today to me. I thought that was absolutely perfect. Because the reason why I became part of this program back when they first saw the first potential indication is because we at NASA had access to a telescope in Hawaii that was in the infrared instead of the visible. So they came to me and they said, hey, you know what? We really need more data. And we need more data with a different wavelength of light. Can we use your telescope? Because we know that you're, you're leading this whole program that NASA has using this telescope. So what did I say? <laughs> the only thing you can say, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> Let me go ask for a director's discretionary time, because I can't give you any telescope time. I don't have the authority. So we went to the director, and they, this is what telescopes do. They have the discretion where they have some telescope side set aside for potential other big things. So I went to, to Richard, who was the director at the time, and said, hey, can we look at this potential transiting uh, planet system? And Richard said, sure. It was only three different potential opportunities that lasted for about four or five hours each. Like, you know, for 15 hours of telescope time, let's, let's give it a try. So this is originally what those transits looked like. Could have been a star spot, could have been transiting planets, but I can tell you the Belgians were excited. So just wondering, are you not impressed yet? Because this is, this, this is it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope you had a wonderful time. This is really what the data looked like. Okay. Now, I want you guys to be prepared to be amazed at the information that we can get out of that, right? So you'll see a lot of talks where they have amazing images and beautiful pictures. And you're like, wow, you can figure out so much information. Just wait till I show you what we can figure out with this. If you're not impressed, I want you to tell me after the talk what does impress you, because <laughs> it's pretty amazing. OK, so we said we needed more data. So we started off with just this one telescope. And this is, by the way, the 3.8 meter, it's UCURT, stands for United Kingdom Infrared Telescope. It's 3.8 meters in size, so I don't remember what that is, 21 feet in diameter, something like that. It's a big, nice big telescope. You can see the handrails right here to see how big it is. Also, the 8 meter telescopes called uh, the Very Large Telescope down in Chile. We like to come up with really unique names sometimes for our acronyms, Very Large Telescope. Um, and then there's a 2 meter uh, telescope as well that we were using. So this is the original set of telescopes that we used for the original discovery. And the original discovery was made back in 
the September to December 2015 timeframe. We submitted the paper by the end of January, because that was the end of the season for the STAR. And by May, the very first Nature paper came out. So those of you who are in this, the audience who are scientists, please raise your hand. Those of you who are scientists in the audience, um, Nature, important journal? Yeah, it's it. It is the premier journal, right? So people talk about, have you ever published in Nature ever? And most scientists are like, yeah, no. <laughs> so before that, that was me. Yeah, no. Maybe someday it would be really cool. So now we have a bunch of Nature papers, which is amazing because we have an amazing team of, of scientists. So this is what was going on. We saw really good transits and enough transits of the first two inner planets, B and C. I show D here because clipping it off would have looked stupid on the slide. But it was really just these two that we had. And then we had something else. So the data for something like this, it makes sense that you have a little dip like that. What is going on here? So this was really fun because when you, I mean, at the time we only had about 15 of us that were working on it. So we were still a small group, sending emails back and forth. They looked at this transit, ground-based telescopes, and said, check it out. Who wants to make bets on what we think this is? So that was a lot of fun. We're like, is there like a double planet system? Is there a triple planet system? Is there a moon around? Like, what is it that we were seeing? But we only saw one transit that looked like that. And then we started the hunt for what the possible periods could be for that. So I was hoping it was like a planet with a moon, but no such luck. Instead, it was seven planets, so that's pretty lucky. But what you can see is that we had three different planets that were going across at the same time, and we didn't have orbits for all of those planets, so we couldn't yet decipher what was going on. So in the paper in Nature in May of 2016, we said we have two planets with really good periods and something else. Thank you very much. The end. <laughs> But we didn't advertise too much because we knew something else cool was going on. But we thought, OK, these guys we knew pretty well. Something else is out here that we called planet D. No real period, somewhere maybe 18 hours, somewhere between 2 and a half and 18 hours, because you know this guy in here was 1 and a half. C is 2 and a half hours. Yeah, 2 and a half hours. Think about that. It goes around its star once every 1 and a half Earth hours. One year long is one and a half Earth hours. So when you go to talk to little children and you explain to them that that means every day and a half you get to have a birthday, <laughs> they get really excited and the parents go, oh, right? Cringe. So this is what our initial system looked like. And everybody was very excited. And we got a lot of web hits. And we were excited about that. I think we got, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred thousand web hits after this. So wow. That was big news. We were excited. We had four ground-based telescopes that we were looking at the system. But we looked at about 18 different periods with these telescopes that we thought that that weird thing might be. And we kept getting, nope, it's not that one. Nope, it's not that one. Nope, it's not that one. No, no, no. So you know what that means? We need more bit data. Not only do we need more data, we really need more data that's not interrupted by things like daytime and clouds, astronomers' worst nightmares. So we decided to go out and try to get data with other telescopes. So we did. And we managed, at that point, especially this little guy right up here. It's not that big of a telescope, but it's in space. And when you're in space, you don't have to worry about day, and you don't have to worry about weather. So that's really great. So we decided to ask for time with the Spitzer Space Telescope. So when we decided to ask for time for the Spitzer Space Telescope, the PI said, first of all, I have to preface this with, has anybody asked for time with a telescope before? Yeah, it's hard, right? With Hubble Space Telescope, it's like for every 10 proposals that are submitted, one gets accepted, for starters. And for secondly, when you ask for time with a space telescope, you ask for like 10 hours or maybe 50, 100 if it's a really, really big, important project. Mikhail said, I think we should ask for 1,000 hours. And I was like, <laughs> really? <coughs> yeah, OK. And then they said, you work for NASA. I think we should ask for, and I was like, so if you think the last one was about, this is really about my pay grade. You need to go ask the director at Spitzer so that he can tell you what a ridiculous idea this is. So we did that. 
went to Sean Carey, JPL, said, hey, we have this really cool system. Look at this other thing, and there's something going on, and we think it's going to be big, and, and we already have two planets, and they're not in the habitable zone, but maybe there's something else that is. Don't you think? We want to ask for 1,000 hours. Well, they don't give 1,000 hours to single investigators. They give them to like giant groups of astronomers. And Sean Carey said, I think that's a good idea. Need a collaborator? <laughs> To which we said, absolutely, that would be great. So we ended up collaborating with Sean, uh, Sean Carey, which has really, really been great. So we asked for 1,000 hours, and we got 1,000 hours. Oh, I know, it's crazy. So the first 500, which is about 20 continuous days, this is the actual data. That's what they look like, data coming in. You can see that occasionally there's gaps for downlinks. We tried to fill those in with ground-based telescope observations. Did a pretty good job, but this, these are what the data look like. So at this point, we knew there were two planets that we knew for sure pretty well, maybe three or four, maybe even five from that other weird thing. I was sitting at a planetary science conference when this came in, sitting next to the co-lead investigator of this project. And, um, and he said, they just reduced the Spitzer data. Because this was coming back in September. It's now like October. They had just downlinked the data. And so we're in the exoplanet system, in a planetary science conference of all places, when I find out that there's this many planets, right? So not three planets, seven. Seven. I was like, what? <laughs> right? So this is very exciting. So I have no idea why it's uh, jittering like that, but um, that's my new computer for you. OK, so this is what the system looked like. This is what we learned the system actually was like. And I show this picture to you in part to show you that it is not at all like our solar system. This is the spacing of our solar system. The entire system fits well within Mercury's orbit. The red signifies that the planets are in an area that is too hot for liquid water facing the surface or the side of the star. The blue indicates too cold, so the whole thing is probably pretty icy. And these guys in the middle, just right. That's why we call it the Goldilocks zone. Yeah, we also call it the habitable zone to try to sound less, I don't know, childlike or something. Um, but that's what our new system looked like. So we then had really good planet orbits for six out of the seven planets. But the seventh planet, we only had one observation. So again, we need more data, right? Of course we need more data. So then we go to Kepler, which is another space telescope. And don't ask for just 40 days. Now we're asking for 79. Yeah, so it, actually a little bit more than that, but we lost a few days uh, because Kepler went into safe mode for a little while. But here's the glitch with this. With the Kepler Space Telescope, they just, we put in a whole proposal, what we wanted to look at. And normally, when you put in a proposal, your team has rights to look at the data by yourself for a period of time. So you can analyze the data, process it, discuss it, put it into a paper, write the paper. Anybody else in here written a paper? I know every one of you scientists in here has written a paper before. It takes a while, right? Absolutely. So they released this data on a Tuesday, which I remember very distinctly at like noon. And we knew that they were going to release it to the entire public at the time, not just to us, which was like, but all right, that's the deal. Telescope belongs to the public. We're taking 79 days of data just on this one thing. If we're going to dedicate that much time, then everybody gets access to it at the same time. So we had everything lined up, everything set. We were testing all of the routines, making sure that we knew exactly what to do so that exactly the moment that this data came out, that we could start analyzing the data. So it was noon on a Tuesday that the data were released. We started analyzing the data, and we put together a paper that was something like 19 pages and four or five figures and a handful of tables and 500 emails exchanged amongst the team. I watched as we did the Google online uh, documents, or I guess it wasn't Google, it was LaTeX that we were using online. If you haven't used LaTeX before, don't try. Um, it's kind of like a programming language in itself. I watched at one point in time, there were 14 of us all editing the document at the same time. By Friday, we submitted the paper. 60 hours to go from data release to paper published in Nature. 
Not bad, right? Yeah. I was in Scotland at the time, so that was interesting too. Um, trying to work on editing paper in between presentations. Didn't know that was going to work out that way, but it did. Okay, so this is what our system looks like. So you can see that these are orbital periods, right? So we look an awful light, lot like the Jovian system, right? In distance away, in the size of the star, we're 20% larger in radius. Remember, 80% more in mass, but we all line up kind of like in the same areas as Io Europa Ganymede Callisto. The only difference is we're a star, Jupiter is not. So we are not like our planet system at all. It's very different. This star is so small and it is so much cooler that the habitable zone is both much, much closer to the star and it's much smaller than the star. So our years are measured in one and a half Earth days to 18 and a half Earth days. Much different. And oh, by the way, that 18 and a half Earth days, here's the cool thing about this. This is a really cool story. So we're looking at this. We know that we have like one extra planet. We know that we need more data. We go to Kepler, we take the data. And in the meanwhile, the brilliant people that I work with, seriously, it's humbling. They're looking at the system. One of the other really cool things about the system is that when you look at planet B, C, D, A is the star, by the way, for those of you who don't know, exoplanet naming schemes. So B, C, D, they are all in resonance with each other, kind of like Io, Europa, Ganymede. Io grows around Jupiter four times for every twice that Europa does, for every once that Ganymede goes around. So same kind of thing. They're resonances, right? So B, C, D, D, C, D, E, each set of three planets are all in resonances, okay? So that's cool because that's not normal. Normally there's such a shakeup when the planet system's being created that that doesn't happen. So another cool thing about the system. So he looked at that um, um, and said, okay, you know what? I bet that this next planet out is also in resonance. So he looked at the possible resonance structures with the other planets, and he predicted that it was going to be a period of 18.87 hours. And it turned out to be like within 0 0.01 hours difference from what his prediction was. If you're not impressed by that. I invite you to try to find an exoplanet system. Yeah, no, it's pretty impressive. So here's our little system right here, and you can see that compared to the Earth, that some of them are a little bit, uh, sorry, a little bit smaller than the Earth, and some of them are a little hotter than the Earth. Uh, these three right here, E, F, and G, are in what are, is considered to be the acceptable uh, habitable zone, Goldilocks zone. D, it just depends on whether or not you're an optimist or a pessimist to decide whether or not D is in the habitable zone or not. Everybody talks about the three planets, but D may or may not be, depending on which models you're using. So that's our last one. That's how they compare in size and in how much flux they get. So remember how I was telling you, be prepared to be amazed. Again, this is what the data, these are, these are real data. This is not like a made up cartoon. This is actually data from our paper. When you look at the depth of the tra transits, and you also know how long it takes to go across the surface of that star, and you see that regular orbital period, you can figure out the radius of the planet, you can figure out the orbital period of the planet, you can figure out the distance to the planet, and therefore, because we know what kind of a star it is, we know exactly where the habitable zone lies, so you can see where they fall with respect to the habitable zone, all from this. Not bad, right? Yeah, scientists are very clever. I was impressed. Um, so this is what our little system looks like. So uh, within our system then, we have, this was our nature paper. So this was really exciting for me to see this, right? Because not only did we get another nature paper out of it, which is cool in itself, we got the cover! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really cool. So that was a lot of fun to watch. So you can even see here, like this was the thing that came out before. Uh, as we were trying to design it. So this is supposed to be representative to show that water here is really in a form of water vapor. It's too warm for liquid water to exist on the surface facing the star. Here things are ice, but you can see that on purpose we have sort of the steamy areas in water and some of the icy areas in water to represent that you can have portions of the surface that have both an icy portion and a bit of a water portion. It just depends on how that planet is orbiting and how it is spinning day to day. This is the other 
really, really impressive thing because, you know, we're looking at this and I'm about to tell you how massive all these planets are. You want to know how that comes out of these data? Because it comes out of these data too. Seriously, you can get all this stuff, I'm not kidding. I know you think I'm lying. But this, take a look right here. And if you know that it should be transiting at this hour right here of its period, but it goes a little bit sooner or it goes a little bit faster, one or the other, a little before or a little after when it's supposed to go, that's because there are other planets in the system that are tugging on it, right? So if it's about to go by and there's another massive planet over here, that gravitational tug will slow it down. If it's going by and there's a planet in front of it, that planet will tug it forward a little bit so it goes a little bit faster. So now imagine that you have seven planets that are all orbiting at given distances and you need to figure out simultaneously the distance away, the, the gravity of each, the masses of each, all interrelated to each other. So that takes a huge amount of computing power. So they have models that looked at all of these different things that were chugging away for a long time to figure out the relative sizes and masses of these planets. So here, ta-da, is the answer and all of this amazing stuff that you can get. Um, the thing that I find very interesting, it, well, there's many things that I find interesting about this, to be honest, but if you look at the planet mass right here, you'll see that some of them are a little bit bigger than the Earth, but there are also some that are smaller. So this is also something that's pretty unique. Most of the systems that we found up until this point, the smallest guys are super Earth-sized. They're bigger than the Earth. So now suddenly we have a system that are not just seven planets, but some are smaller in radius and smaller in mass. But you look at the planetary densities, they're all, some of them are a little bit lower, so we think that that, that has to do with how much rock you have in there versus how much ice you have. So you can now get a sense of how icy, how rocky the planets are. Um, and for those of you who are really super interested in this thing called surface gravity, if you look at every single one of those planets, if you decide to take a trip out to Trappist, you will weigh less than you do here on the Earth. So also very exciting for those of you who are looking for interplanetary travel. So this is what our little system looks like. And you can see that the pictures that I was showing you before had different artist conceptions of what the surfaces might look like. And what I want to point out is we have no idea. Because remember that data that I was showing you? That's all we know for sure. How do you know what they look like from just looking at that? You don't. But everybody wants to know what they look like. So we make something up. Because <laughs> as a scientist, you got to have an imagination sometimes. But it's not completely without rhyme or reason. Because when you're looking at these, these guys are the ones that are in the, well, habitable zone and the optimistic habitable zone. And you can see that with some of them, they look like they might have like cracks on the surface, but there might be some water on the surface. H is actually probably all very icy, kind of like looking at Europa or Enceladus. Um, the other question then is whether or not any of these guys spin or not. But what should we name them? So far, they are Trappist 1b, Trappist 1c, <laughs> Trappist 1d, right? And all the little kids are like, that's not a name. So we know who's in charge of this project. They have come up with names. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and as I understand it, there's at least 13 different Trappist beers, so we have room to discover more planets. <laughs> so one of the team members, as we were going through and the big announcement was made, so the big announcement, for those of you who remember or don't remember, it was February, I think, 22nd or something like that of 2017. So it was just over a year ago. And so somebody put that together at, um, to send out to the team. So now you're looking at this, you're like, wow, this is cool. Trap is such a cool system. But haven't we discovered other exoplanets? We have. Lots and lots. Take a look, right? Just between January and July of 2015, you can see how many. Our little planets fall in this little box. And you're like, wow, that does not look like we're very special, so why do we care about TRAPPIST? Why is it different? So it's different in part because they are planets that are around a very, very small star, so that makes them very different. They have an incident flux that allows three to four of them 
to be inside of the habitable zone. They have sizes that are equivalent and smaller than the Earth. They have densities that indicate that they are rocky bodies. And if you have a rocky body, not only can you stand on the surface, but everybody knows how much life exists on the surface of the Earth and how many weird life forms exist on the surface of the Earth. And if you can get a lot of weird life forms existing on the surface of the Earth, why could you not get weird life forms existing here as well? And so there will be some scientists, and I've seen some publications that say, but the solar flares are great, and there are x-rays and ultraviolet rays. And they are right. This is a star that is very active. And I can guarantee you that people and scientists said there is absolutely no way that in the depths of the ocean next to black smokers that are belching out sulfuric sorts of gases that you could ever have life, except the type, the type that thrives on sulfur, <laughs> right? You'll never get any life existing in the deserts of Antarctica except the kind that live inside of the rocks, right? There's all kinds of extremophiles. You could never possibly get anything that could handle any kind of radiation that's, that's sitting outside of the Earth. And then you find that you have spacecraft that come back and you still have bacteria that have survived the rigors of space. So there are many different kinds of ways that life has figured out to exist in places that we as humans are certain could never happen because the universe doesn't know that the humans have made rules like that. <laughs> so why is this special? There are about 5,000 exoplanet candidates. There are over 3,700 that are confirmed. There are 380 Earth-sized planets that are radius greater than about one and a quarter Earth masses. There are only 23 that are Earth mass-like exoplanets, but there are only 10 that are confirmed in the habitable zones of their stars. So we start off with a huge number of planets, and you have to start somewhere. But we're still at a very special time in the history of understanding how the universe forms and how life can potentially exist out there. So I have to say that I so wish that this was a period of time that Carl Sagan could be here and see this is what we are understanding, this is what we are seeing, and this is what we're discovering. It really is out there. So that excitement that he gave to everybody. I remember watching him as a little kid, meeting him when I was in just an undergraduate, unable to speak when I, could, when I met him directly. That's embarrassing. Really embarrassing, but got to meet him. And so that was cool. So I wish that he could see this as well. So these are our three. And you can see that these are um, in terms of distance away, so this one, this one, and this one are not yet confirmed, but they're working on it, at least when I looked up this information, uh, which was, as you can see, a little bit, a little while ago. Um, but we are three of the very closest potentially habitable planets, and because of that, we are a great test bed for discovering whether or not there's an atmosphere, whether or not there's evidence that there is ozone or water or carbon dioxide or methane that indicates that there is life. So one of the other things that people ask is, how are these guys spinning? And do you have them spinning constantly like the Earth is so that you have day and night? And the answer is we don't know for sure. There is definitely a camp of scientists that are looking at how, for instance, our moon goes around our Earth and it always faces the same side. So if that's the case and you have tidal synchronization, which is what it's called, it means the same place is always facing your star. Now this could be bad or it could be good. Because with some of these, like the innermost planets, you say no way could life exist there. Sure. Um, but the edges, the twilight, might have just the right amount of sunlight there so that closer in, everything's hot and baked out. The backside is all icy, and somewhere in between is a nice little ocean world. right? So you could have that on any of A, B, C, sorry, B, C, D, E, F. I forgot what the Trappist beer names were, but I'd love to, to list them out for you right now. So if we're going to understand then whether or not there's the possibility of life, we really want to understand whether or not there's an atmosphere. Because you really need an atmosphere if you're going to have liquid water on the surface, because otherwise it just escapes into space, the vacuum of space. 
So you want to make sure that you have an atmosphere. So we do something called transmission spectroscopy. So we've been starting off, and I was talking with a few of you about this before we started tonight. Transmission spectroscopy is something where you want to understand the light that goes through the atmosphere of the planet. So you have some sunlight that comes through, visible light, that would show you just the radius of the physical size of the Earth if there was no atmosphere. Now this is greatly exaggerated, obviously, but imagine that you have an atmosphere. Some light will not penetrate the atmosphere. So for certain wavelengths of light, the planet radius will look larger. And then in others, it will penetrate through. So that's one of the ways that you can start to get a sense for how big the atmosphere might be. So we don't have telescopes out there yet that can do quite what this is talking about in the way that we want to do it. Because what we need is more data. We need more data with more space telescopes. See, you're with me. <laughs> exactly. Eileen, can you do that for us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's the chief scientist of Johnson Space Center. So who's above her pay grade? Definitely above mine. So this, then, is actual transmission spectroscopy that we took with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we talked about using Kepler. We talked about using Spitzer. We've also used the Hubble Space Telescope. And you know which one we're going to want to use next. The James Webb Telescope. Exactly. Yeah, we're working on that already. So what this shows you, because I was looking at this is a, another, huh, another, it's, it's been amazing. It's really been an amazing uh, year and a half of um, publishing papers. Um, so this is Julian Zwit. He's also Belgian uh, at MIT right now. The data are these guys right here. And the different lines are different potential models. So what you can see is these guys here are models that are very heavily rich in hydrogen. So those would be models that are more typical of Jovian planets. So we know that we can rule out Jovian planet type atmospheres. So that's stage one. Stage two is trying to understand then whether or not they could be water rich, whether or not they are cloud free. So models that are water rich and cloud free are these guys right here. So you can see that this is for B and this is for C. And so we did this first and then, sorry for the blinding white, but then we did this for the both potentially the ones that we know are in the, in the habitable zone as well as the optimistic. So we now have transmission spectroscopy from Hubble for B, C, D, E, F, and G. We haven't done H. That's outside of the habitable zone. So we don't expect there to be an atmosphere that far out when it's very cold. We expect that to be more like Enceladus. And you guys, I think, had a talk on Enceladus recently. So again, when you're looking at these guys right here, they have water-rich and nitrogen-rich, uh, carbon dioxide-rich. And what you're seeing is especially like this right here, the black dots right here are the data and are kind of consistent with potentially having a nitrogen or water-rich atmosphere. Wouldn't that be interesting? But we really want to know if there's methane, and we really want to know if there's ozone. And we really need James Webb Telescope for that. But this is a really good potential vision of what that system could look like. And I love the fact that the planets themselves look very large there, because if you were there, those planets would look more like our moon in terms of size and distance. So you could see what those other planetary surfaces look like, because they're all so packed closely together, right? You could go for vacation to TRAPPIST-1E or TRAPPIST-1F, right, instead of just going over to the other side of the planet that you're on. This was the thing, though, that was the most exciting for me the day that we made the discovery and made the announcement, because I already knew there were seven planets. But that's fun. <laughs> Very, very exciting. So we got the Google Doodle for not one day, but two. And all I have to say is I have a very different bar for whether or not the science that I'm doing is important now. <laughs> <laughs> so this was not only exciting to us, right? So one of the collaborators on the project, one of the, the co-leaders um, like on the project, just sent out an email that evening saying, go check out Google. And I thought it was like, trying to figure out how many web hits we've gotten. Remember, we've gotten like 100,000 for like the last round, right? So I went to Google to try to figure out, you know, just type in Trappist, and I got there, and I was like, oh, look! <laughs> yeah, so my sister was there at the time, I think. And she's like, what is your, no, no, look, this is it. So that's our little Google Doodle. 
Um, so it turns out that NASA, in the first two weeks, did some research to figure out how many web hits we got. 3.2 billion. So we did a little better than the first round. Yeah. So there's like, what, between 7 and 8 billion people in the world? So that means either half the world knows, or there's like 8 people that were just <laughs> clicking away, right? So, yeah, exactly. So the next stage, of course, is what will we see from James Webb? So Hubble Space Telescope is a little under two and a half meters in size. James Webb is six and a half meters in size. Hubble Space Telescope did some infrared, but not the mid-infrared that we're going to be able to do with James Webb. So I know that everybody's like, oh, it's delayed again. But let's make sure we get it right, because we're going to launch it past the orbit of the moon, and we do not have the opportunity to go fix it like we do with the Hubble Space Telescope. So they are being very careful and very diligent. And as with anything NASA, when we do things, we do things that are the really hard things that nobody's done before. And it turns out that when you do things that are really hard that nobody's done before, sometimes you don't know exactly what you need to do for testing until you get to the point where you're like, oh, hey, we better test this first. So just be patient. We're working on it. And I think we're going to do a fantastic job of getting really cool data. So this is what the James Webb Telescope looks like. Very briefly, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a very unique looking telescope that has sunshades on it. And you see that there is light coming through the atmosphere of the star. And this is not transmission spectroscopy, obviously, of our you know, exoplanet system. But it's the kind of thing that you can get where you're looking for the ozone, the methane, um, the carbon dioxide, and the water. And those are the sorts of things that are very indicative that you have an atmosphere and especially the methane and the ozone, that you have life. And if you want more information about why that's more indicative of life, I can answer that for you <coughs> at some time later. But that's the transmission spectroscopy that we're going for. So this is, again, one of the first rounds where we just sort of have an animation that goes through so that you can get a sense of each of these planets. And you see how you have the icy side on one side, assuming that you have um, a very hot side over here. There's a possibility, then, that maybe in these terminator zones, can see that the first two we assumed they weren't going to have liquid water, but you might have icy here, hot here, and then this in between if it's always facing the same side to the star where you could have some liquid water. And then as you move out, you see that it's icier on the back. The ice moves in towards the terminator and just the, the potentially central portion. But of course, you would have to have a thick enough atmosphere to be able to retain that. So that's what we'll be looking for. So I think they did a really nice job with this. Um, we've had some differing ideas of what the surfaces might look like based on some updated ideas of the sizes of the planets and the densities of the planets since we've gotten more data since this original was looked at. The last one that you saw was the idea of having one planet that maybe had a full rotation instead of being tidally locked. Some people think that might not even be possible because of the resonances between the planets. So that is our full planetary system. And for some reason, JPL got into this habit, which I think was really interesting, of creating posters. And the posters themselves are individual for the planetary systems. And our science team was able to work with them on this. So they actually have, if this looks to you kind of like Orion, but like shoulder, shoulder, but it's kind of twisted, that's what Orion would look like from Trappist. So they took where Trappist was in the galaxy and have the view from there and the sizes of these planets as well. And so you can see that there's sort of a little bit of brightness there for those of you that are in the front. It's the imagination that you have another civilization and you're looking at their night side and this is what it would look like. So, and for those of you that can't read the bottom, it says planet Hop from Trappist 1E voted the best Hab Zone vacation within 12 parsecs of Earth. So that's a really fun thing. So that is uh, the complete talk. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them for you. And I hope that you guys enjoyed tonight. OK, so we're going to take some questions. And please wait for a microphone so we can make sure we, uh, everybody can hear us. I'm curious how many hours you're asking for on the James Webb Telescope. As many as they'll give us. <laughs> so the proposals aren't yet due because the telescope launch was slipped. So the team is definitely planning on um, submitting some proposals to that. But my understanding is that this has already been selected 
as one of the initial targets for James Webb. So they took a look at all the potential things that they thought were you know, most important for the first round of what James Webb would look at. And this was one of them. So that's really exciting for us. Yeah. How did they form so close to the sun? So that's a fabulous question. And um, I've had an entire class on planetary formation, so it would take a really long time to, get, to go through that. But the, the short version is that, with at least with the rocky planets, we think that, in general, the way that planetary systems form is that you have a giant cloud of gas and dust, and you have uh, rocky materials. And, and as the star starts to spin and collapse, all of those materials collapse towards the center, which is why you tend to have planetary systems that are in a disk. And the things that are closest in are going to be the hottest, so you have the rockiest stuff that can condense very close to the star and all the way out. And then as you move out, things like ices can start to condense. And then as, as you get farther and farther away for systems that are big enough to have Jovian-type planets, then you eventually get enough of a seed where you can have hydrogen gases connect um, gravitationally uh, falling onto those planets as well. So there's, there's a sort of a general idea and theory of how those planetary systems form. This system, though, we believe because they are in resonances that it's absolutely expected that they formed farther out than what they are right now and that they have migrated inward until they, they fit those particular resonances and, and then held onto the, those resonances. So that's, that's my two-minute overview of an entire semester. How was that? I don't know if you said this, but what's the approximate distance of that system from us? So it's, I, I don't think I actually did say that one out loud. Yeah. So I've only given this talk about 25 times. Um, and I think I said it for the first 24. So sorry that you missed those. <laughs> Just kidding. It's about 39 and a half light years away. Yeah. 12 parsecs for those of you who are scientists. Yeah. What's a parsec? Exactly. About 39 and a half light years. Almost 40. So really, it's in our backyard. I know that 39 light years to those of you that aren't scientists might sound like a really, really long distance because that's how long it would take for a particle of light moving at light speed to get from there to here. But our one galaxy is 100,000 light years across into the next galaxy is two and a half million light years away, not including the large and small Andromeda clouds, right? And then if you look at the entire universe, right, the entire universe, um, well, the age of the universe is 13.4 or 7 billion, 8? What's, I don't know what the, yeah, I don't know what the current, the current digits are, 13.82 billion years, right? So when you look at things like millions of light years and billions of light years, that's when you're like, oh, yeah, 39 and a half backyard. <laughs> so it really is one of the 60 closest red dwarf stars to our sun, just in our local, our local neighborhood in the galaxy. Could you explain a little bit, can the Hubble be used, is the dwarf star too bright? Can you get a picture of what the surfaces look like using the Hubble? So no, we cannot. Um, what we have from the Hubble is really the data that I was showing you, right, dots. I know it's not very exciting. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're too small and they're too far away for the resolution to be able to look at the surfaces. So really, all we're looking at is not the planets directly, but the starlight that gets dimmed. So we're looking at the starlight dimming <coughs> and figuring all that. Are you impressed? Yeah. I'm impressed. Um, again, humble, great group of scientists. Any other questions? What criteria need to be met? Um in order to classify a planet as habitable? That's a great question. To be a habitable planet, first you have to be in the habitable zone, or at least that's the idea that people have. Technically, you can be outside of the habitable zone as long as you have enough heat, right? So they're looking at things like when you have some of the, um, the ice giants around the, the Jovian planets, if there's tidal heating so that you can liquefy some sort of water, it, assuming that water is the medium that, you, that life is forming, you really want to be able to have liquid water is really what it comes down to in the most basic of terms. But when we're looking for habitable planets, we tend to start with, okay, 
let's make sure that they're within the habitable zone, because if they are, then we know that we can have liquid water existing on their surface. And with the, if you don't have liquid water, you don't have that medium for you know, the little amoebas and life forms to have a transport mechanism to get the energy and the ingredients and such for the life to be able to exist. It's kind of like we as humans, if we freeze um, humans or life forms, right, then you have an issue at that point because the water can't move around inside your cells. So you really need to have liquid water. Now it's possible that life forms might be existing with some other kind of medium. Um, they might have like liquid methane or liquid ammonia, that sort of thing. But there are advantages that water has. It's a polar molecule, so because of that, like the ice expands to be able to, to trap liquid water underneath when you freeze. Otherwise, you have the frozen um, lakes going from bottom to top, and so that's not very good for life. So I've taught also an entire class on life in the universe, so that answer could be an entire semester long if, if we wanted it, but I don't think people want to stick around for quite that long. But liquid water, there's your key. Okay, in terms of uh, finding life, have researchers uh, considered the effect of uh, tidal locking on the weather that could be very high winds because of the temperature differences and also the stability of the rotational axes, uh, which may not be that stable because of the, the tidal locking and whether or not, because of, again, slow rotation, if there can be protective magnetic fields. Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> right? So all of these things matter when it comes to this, right? So one of the reasons why we believe that Earth is such a host for life is that we have this really big moon compared to the size of our planet. And that really helps to stabilize the axis, right? So that helps to make sure that, that uh, temperatures and such are stable. And he's talking about the magnetic field, right? Mars could potentially be habitable but it's much smaller, so it radiated off its heat much sooner, and so we think that the interior core that would have been a molten metal to produce a magnetic bubble to help protect us from really energetic particles is probably frozen out. It doesn't have much a such a, a magnetic field like the Earth does right now. So all of those different things, the tidal locking and the stability of the axes, and whether or not there's additional tidal heating from the other planets. We know, we expect that there is additional tidal heating that could help as well. All of those things have to play a role, and so all of those things are being debated heavily right now. Yes? Uh, do red dwarfs in general have less or more uh, radiation than our sun, or you know, stars like our sun? So the red dwarf, so our sun is, um, just under 6,000 Kelvin in temperature. This one is more like 2550 in temperature. The, te the surface temperature of the star is quite a bit lower, right? So the amount of radiation coming off the star is much lower. However, this particular kind of a star is known to be fairly active in the flares and the UV radiation that's coming off of it. And so, believe it or not, there's actually debate about whether or not that will inhibit life from forming or help life from forming because it is a more active type of a star. But we think this star in particular, Trappist-1, we think is about eight, eight and a half uh, billion years old, something like that. So it's past its infancy of being crazy, right? But dwarf stars like this live for tens of billions of years. So every red dwarf star that's ever been born is still alive. So it has a really, really, really long time scale ahead of it to allow life to potentially evolve. Question over here. Um, hi, is the hi. Uh, char characterization of the planets being tidally locked just an assumption right now or accepted? And then how would that be verified? So we do not have a way to verify whether or not the planets are tidally locked. We are looking at the fact that the planets themselves are in resonance with, with each other. And so because of the way that the planets are in resonance with each other, that's going to cause uh, the interaction with um, uh, with the spin axes as well. So I know that there's been discussion where they think that maybe some or all could be tidally locked, but I don't, I haven't heard that it's accepted at all. We just don't have enough data. We need more telescopes. So, um, uh, over here. Thank you. Uh, the, 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 the sound <laughs> is coming from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the question I have is, has to do with aperture of telescopes, you okay. know, uh, so. Uh, we know that you can never get a big enough physical telescope to to um, 
to physically image any of this stuff. Uh, the question is, is how big of a virtual aperture would you need in order to actually, or can you even, could you ever discern it uh, because of the, the light signature of the sun uh, that is, uh, you know, sort of overwhelming the planetary signatures? So it turns out that uh, there, is, there has been some direct imaging that's been done of planets. Now you're not looking at the surfaces like you are of the planetary surfaces in our solar system. But there has been some direct imaging of exoplanets. And it's basically what you want to do is if the star is brightest in the visible, you're looking in the infrared because in the visible, the starlight is this much brighter than the planet, but in the infrared, it might only be this much brighter, right? So there, there have been a small number that have been imaged directly but not the details on the planetary surfaces. So what kind of re resolution? Uh, resolution goes as wavelength of, over the diameter of the telescope. So I think the answer is really big, really big. Um, but I would have to sit down and do the calculation, which I have not done and probably can't do in the next 30 seconds. Where are you? Sorry. A couple more. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, you mentioned that uh, several research groups have used several different telescopes to study the TRAPPIST system. Um, has anybody used the Arecibo radio telescope just to, just to listen in? So, okay, so, good, so the answer is there are a ton of people looking at it with a ton of different telescopes right now, which is really cool. So I have this thing that sort of sends you an email every time your paper gets referenced. I think like every other day there's a, some of the planet or some of the papers that we've written, especially the one about the seven planets is being referenced. So I know that there's a lot of energy out there to gather information. Um, I don't know specifically about Arecibo, but I do know specifically that within a week or two of this being announced that uh, the leaders at SETI Institute, have, has anybody heard of SETI? Search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Anyway, they sent me an email and said, hey, we want to look at Trappist, but we need help to figure out when to look. Can you help us with that? So I sent an email out to a number of the team members and said, not everybody likes this sort of thing, <laughs> right? Is anybody out there who can do the calculations? I don't have those models. But a couple of team members were like, that would be so cool. That would be the coolest thing ever. So absolutely, we sent them information um, to look to see whether or not there was any indication of signals. And so far, there's not. But they're still looking because that would be cool. <laughs> I was just having a discussion this morning with somebody about whether or not there's the likelihood of intelligent life existing elsewhere in the universe. And I told them the story about how a guy who did tours at JPL would ask every tour, how many of you think intelligent life exists someplace else but beyond the Earth? And he said, you know, 10, 15% would kind of, yeah. But like not want anybody else to see if they had raise their hand. And then they did a poll at the Division for Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society, <laughs> of which I was sitting with 800 other people who had PhDs or were working on PhDs in planetary science, and asked the same question. And I think every last person in the room raised their hand when they said, do you think intelligent life exists somewhere else in the universe? It is so vast. It is so big. There are hundreds of billions of stars. The, or hundreds of billions of galaxies out there. You can have a trillion stars in a single galaxy, and our one Earth has so many ways to figure out how to have life form. It just doesn't make sense that we would be it. And if we were it, wouldn't that be so much of a waste? Uh, you may. <laughs> That's a big universe for one inhabited planet. Excuse me, you may have answered that. But are there any signs that there are gases? Oh, are there any signs of uh, uh, any signs? Gases. gases emitted into the atmospheres of the planets? So all we've been able to do at this point is say that it, we do not believe that it is a hydrogen-dominated atmosphere. we got to wait for James Webb to really get better information than that at this point. Baker telescope. In okay, space. we'll just go ahead and wrap up our Q&A. Thank you. She'll be out here in the lobby, so if you can speak to her. Thank you very much. And everybody's hungry.
Thanks for coming. We'll see you in the summer.